Hello, my name's Richard Felix, and I'm going to take you on a tour of the city of Derby. A special tour, visiting some of the more sinister sides of this city. A tour of the streets and alleyways that are familiar to us all, that we all use, going to work or shopping. Streets and alleyways that were once the haunts of pickpockets, robbers, vagabonds, murderers, prostitutes and highwaymen. And what better place to start this tour than this Derby jail, the one that's still preserved. I'm sitting in one of the day rooms at the jail, used for debtors. They could work in here and they were allowed out in the daytime and then return to their night cells at dusk. But from the year 1800, there were over 200 hanging offences in this country. The crime rate had exploded and the government made just about anything you could imagine a hanging offence, including cutting down trees, breaking down riverbanks, stealing a horse, stealing a sheep, stealing a cow, setting fire to haystacks, appearing on the street with a sooty face. Poaching and burglary were all hanging offences. In front of this building in 1817, four unfortunate men were hanged for setting fire to haystacks at South Wingfield. In the same year, three men were hanged and beheaded for high treason, the Pentridge revolutionaries. A girl of 16 was hanged in front of this building, admittedly for murder. The last woman in Derby, hanged in 1822 in front of this building. Some unfortunates cheated the hangman, and in the case of the Jones brothers from Ashbourne, burglars, they hanged themselves in one of the condemned cells the night before their execution. The jailer opened the door in the morning to find the two brothers hanging from the wood above the door of their jail. He fetched the surgeon to bleed them, to revive them, so they could hang them later that day. But they were dead and they buried them beneath the gallows. One unfortunate man called Charles Pleasance, a forger, a very popular man in Derby, a petition was set up to save his life and they believed that it would be commuted to life transportation instead of hanging. But two days after his respite, which was putting off the hanging, the second order came in to hang him and he was hanged three days later. And it states on his penny dreadful that the executioner was a fellow prisoner of his own choosing, to whom he paid a handsome present. And during the hanging, the knot of the rope occasioned itself beneath his chin, causing him great agony for over 20 minutes before he finally died much convulsed. And so ended the tragic life of poor Charles Pleasance, the forger of Derby. This is the second of three county jails, and this was built in 1756. We're in the basement, in the central corridor of the jail, with the original doors on the left hand, right hand side, and the original cells behind them. These doors, all original, bear graffiti and scratchings from them. This we believe to be a debtor's cell. People were incarcerated for debt, and this wonderful inscription here from I. Taylor of Meesham for a £10 debt, 1807. Next door, one of the cells that we believe was used as a condemned cell, as many of them would be down here, and bears the graffiti of the poor unfortunates that were about to be executed. The night before your execution, you scratched a scaffold on the door and put your initials inside it. J.G. James Gratian, W.H. with a gallows round him, or her, I.H. and another one here, a man called Cotton here, and someone here called Brown. This man was one of four men hanged in front of this jail in 1817 for setting fire to haystacks at South Wingfield. Inside the cell here, which as I say we believe is one of the condemned cells, a room where no light can enter. More scratchings on the doors, and here you can see the lines 
on the doors. These were the days that you'd got left before you were executed. Someone's even scratched a Christmas tree on the door here. The original lock. Boards all the way around here, known as Penny Dreadfuls. The week before you were executed, the local newspaper came in and interviewed you, and you told them their whole story. They then printed it and sold it for a penny a sheet at your public execution. One of them here for those poor unfortunate men, Brown, Jackson, Booth and King. Hanged in 1817. Here we have the sentence of the prisoners, an original one. And here we can see Brown, Jackson, Booth and King and also with them, Thomas Hopkinson. He was a mate of theirs, but he turned King's evidence against them, and he got off with his life. But the following year, if we come round here, we find Thomas Hopkinson, Jr. suffered this day on the new drop in front of the county jail Derby for highway robbery. They got him a year later. And Jackson's father volunteered to be the hangman to hang Thomas Hopkinson. And here, on this corridor door, the original game of hangman. Matchstick men scratched on the door before their execution. And this incredible one here, Parker and Booth. Two men hanged for horse stealing in 1804. And when they put their little effigies on this door, they made them lifelike. Because Booth was a six foot four giant. And as you can see, his feet are much, much farther down the picture than his accomplice, Parker. These two men, unfortunately hanged here at Derby in 1804 for horse stealing. This rather inconspicuous blue plaque in St Peter Street here in Derby marks the site of a house called Babington Hall. The plaque reads, this plaque marks the site of Babington Hall, townhouse of the conspirator Anthony Babington. Mary Queen of Scots stayed here on the night of January the 13th, 1585. Babington was a Catholic and was plotting to murder Queen Elizabeth. He wanted to put the Catholic Mary Queen of Scots on the throne of England. He and the Catholic world believed that Mary Queen of Scots should have been the true queen not her illegitimate Protestant cousin, Elizabeth. Babington unfortunately was captured and hanged, drawn and quartered. And it was the Babington plot that sealed the fate of Mary Queen of Scots. She was executed at Fotheringay Castle in 1587. And it was the Babington plot that sealed her fate. There are one or two lasting reminders still here in Derby of that plot, that murder plot. We still have Babington Lane. And over here, of course, where Waterstone stands now, the Babington Buildings. And for those shoppers walking up St. Peter Street, if they look to the top of the Babington Buildings, they can see a stone coat of arms, two monkeys dancing on a barrel. They're special monkeys, they're baboons. And the barrel, in Tudor or Elizabethan words, was known as a ton. And of course, baboons, ton, over the years have become Babington, a lasting reminder of the man plotting to murder Queen Elizabeth and the man responsible for the death of Mary Queen of Scots. Before the time of Henry VIII, any criminals that were captured were taken to Nottingham Jail. It was the Sheriff of Derby and Nottingham. Henry VIII granted us a charter giving us the right to have our own county jail but it took us until the time of Queen Elizabeth to establish the first jail here at Derby. It was situated just across here where Brown's the Jewellers are now. A foul, stinking place built below the water level of the Mark Eaton Brook, which till to this day flows underneath Victoria Street and underneath St Peter's Bridge. I'm now walking over a nine metre wide little river still gushing along here. The jail was more or less on the site where I'm standing now. Built below the water level and every time it flooded, the prisoners were not hanged, but they drowned. 
In 1610, three prisoners were drowned when the Mark Eaton Brook burst its banks. The jailer wrote on his report, three of my prisoners drowned instead of hanged. This was a notorious prison and the first person to die in terrible circumstances was the Stapen Hill witch, Alf Goodridge. Brought from Burton-on-Trent to Derby, tried and sentenced to hang. She died the night before her execution here in the Derby Jail. In 1608, two more witches, the Bakewell witches, brought to Derby, imprisoned in this jail and hanged on the county gallows at the top of St Peter Street in 1608. The next person, George Fox, the Quaker, imprisoned here after blaspheming in the church at Derby, in the cathedral as it is now. This is where the Quaker movement started, when George Fox stood before the magistrate, Gervais Bennett, pointed at him and said, ye should quake at the word of the Lord. And they said, after that event at Derby, they called us Quakers at Derby, after his imprisonment here in the Derby jail. Three Catholic priests were imprisoned here in 1588. After the incident with Mary Queen of Scots and Babington, anyone who was Catholic was rounded up and brought here to Derby. 37 recusants or Catholics imprisoned in this jail. 12 died of jail fever, which was a form of typhus. A visiting priest in this jail died of the stench in Derby jail. These three Catholic priests sentenced to be executed by hanging, drawing and quartering, were taken from this place, strapped onto what was known as a hurdle, a wooden sledge, and dragged through the streets of Derby to the place of execution, St Mary's Bridge. And this is the original St Mary's Bridge over the River Derwent, and above it, the old medieval bridge chapel. On July the 24th, 1588, the three Catholic priests Ludlam, Simpson and Garlic were dragged here, hanged for three minutes and then taken down for the rest of the sentence to be carried out. That sentence was that you and each of you be taken from this place to a place of execution where you'll be severally hanged but taken down while you are still alive, your privy parts cut off and burnt before your eyes, your bowels and entrails ripped out of your belly and also burnt, your head to be severed from your body and your body to be divided into four equal quarters and those quarters to be at the disposal of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth and may the Lord have mercy upon your souls. Those three priests actually had that sentence carried out here on this bridge in 1588. Their quarters were then hoisted onto the town side of the roof of this chapel as a warning to all Roman Catholics. All the burnings that took place in Derby took place more or less on this spot where I'm standing now. This is Lime Avenue, just off Burton Road. It was originally known as Windmill Pit. A young blind girl called Joan Waste was burnt here on August the 1st, 1556. She was a heretic. We didn't burn witches in England. They were usually hanged. The Scots used to burn them. We used to burn people for either heresy or petty treason. That was murdering or plotting to murder your husband or your boss. And the last burning took place on this spot in 1698, not that long ago. A young farm girl from Swanwick who was plotting on murdering her boss. Bradshaw Way behind me here. Before that it was known as Bradshaw Street and before that Bradshaw Hay. After Matthew Coughlin had been hanged, his body was taken down and tarred to preserve it. He was then brought up here on a wagon and a 30-foot gibbet post put up here at the top of the hill. He was wrapped in chains and his body was put into a gibbet cage and he was hoisted up onto the top of the post and was left there for the crows to peck at his eyes and his body to rot until all that would be left were his bleaching bones swinging in the wind here at the top of Bradshaw Hay. He was the last man to be gibbeted in Derby.
We know there were many sites in Derby where people were hanged. Um, we know for a fact they were executed on Nuns Green, which is Friargate. We know a gentleman was hanged in the town hall on the marketplace. But the vast majority of hangings took place on this spot at the top of Normanton Road. This is where the county gallows was situated. Right at the top on the pinnacle of the hill. Thousands of people, of course, turned up to watch these executions and there would be a good sight here for them to be seen by the vast multitude. The condemned was loaded onto a wagon or a cart at the bottom of St Peter Street where the county jail was and brought in slow procession up here to the top of Normanton Road, stood on the back of the wagon, a white cap pulled over their face, their hands bound, after they'd entertained the crowd with a speech, a confession, Someone would then hit the backside of the horse. The horse would draw away and they would be left swinging in the breeze, taking about quarter of an hour to die of slow strangulation. Kicking, writhing, choking, vomiting on this very spot where we're standing now on Normanton Road. How many people wandering up and down St Peter's Street doing their shopping on a Saturday realise that opposite British Home Stores, St Peter's Church and underneath this churchyard the number of executed people that lay buried. The county jail was at the bottom here on the corner of the Corn Market in St Peter's Street and at the top of the road lay the county gallows. So the cart or wagon took its slow procession up this street, they were hanged and then brought back here to the nearest church or churchyard, St Peter's, and deposited in an unmarked grave somewhere underneath my feet. How many folks walking along Friargate and don't realise that here in front of this building, which of course is the site of the county jail, stood the gallows, the new drop, First built here in 1812 to hang two burglars, Tomlinson and Cook. The condemned would come out of their cell, led by the jailer, behind would be possibly the sheriff, and the ordinary or the chaplain of the jail. They would make their long, slow procession along the tunnel and out to the front of this building. They would then climb the steps and onto the gallows. There would be a vast crowd of people waiting for them. They would entertain the crowd, probably with a couple of psalms and a hymn, long ones if they knew them. They would then confess or say that they were innocent. Then the executioner would prepare them. The rope would be fitted around their neck and tightened and a white cap pulled down over the face because of the hideous contortions of the face. Then the executioner would step forward and push the lever, which launched them into eternity. The last man hanged in front of this building was George Batty in 1825 for rape. And what about these heads here in Friargate, nearly opposite the site of the county jail? They represent the riots of 1831 when the reform bill was thrown out of the House of Lords. People up and down the country were very upset at not being given the right to have a vote. There were riots in Bristol, Nottingham and here at Derby. They attacked the shop of Mr Bemrose in the corn market in Derby and also attacked Mark Eaton Hall where Mrs Mundy lived. Some of the rioters were arrested and locked in what had become the town jail. The following morning hundreds more rioters came into Derby. They surged up Friargate, uprooted a gas lamp standard and battered in the gates of the jail and released the prisoners from Derby Jail. They then surged up Vernon Street and laid siege to the newly built County Jail. Shots were fired, one of the rioters was killed. The cavalry were brought in from Nottingham and eventually dispersed and the Reform Bill riots were over. These heads here represent those prisoners and rioters that were released from the Derby Jail. Where were you on the night of the 21st of June, 1856? If you'd been living in either Chaddesden or Spondon, this is possibly a question that would have been asked to you by the police. Because on that fateful night here on Nottingham Road, 
a dreadful murder took place. The murder of a semi-cripple called Enoch Stone, who lived in Spondon. Because he was a cripple, he had very little money, and he had to make his way by blowing the organ at Spondon Church, and also as a silk glove maker. On that fateful night, he was returning, after walking all the way from Spondon to Derby, to pick up a hamper of clothes from his son. He used to do his son's washing. He was on his way back along here over Cherry Tree Hill when he was murdered. He was battered to death by a person or persons unknown. About 11.20 in the evening, he was hit on the head from behind and collapsed on the grass. One or two people actually witnessed the event. A gentleman returning from the plough in heard a cry of murder and thought that it was some drunks acting about. Later in the evening, two men returning from the Chesterfield Arms, a pub near the cattle market in Derby, saw the body lying in the hedgerow here, but thought he was a drunk. He was moaning. His face looked black, but in fact the black was dirt and blood on his face. Later on in the night, a coachman returning from Derby saw the body, stopped and tried to help him, loaded him onto a cart and took him back to a doctor in Spondon. Poor old Enoch Stone died about half past three that morning. The police set up an inquiry, but unfortunately they never found the murder. The coroner's inquest was delayed until the 24th of July, 1856, and then the coroner could wait no longer, and a verdict of willful murder by persons unknown was recorded. And to this very day, no one knows who murdered Enoch Stone. A subscription was had, and the people of this area paid money to erect this stone. It's known as the Enoch Stone, and as you can see, it's got his initials on it to this day. And that murder remains unsolved to this very day. This is Derby's West End. Tightly packed little houses, one up, one down, five families sharing a tap and a toilet in the yard. In 1862, just at the back of me here, in Agard Street, which runs parallel to the Mark Eaton Brock, a rather horrendous murder took place. A young lady called Eliza Morrow lived there in court number four, Agard Street. She was dating a man called Dick Thorley. She was two-timing him, and she was seeing a soldier at the same time. One day in April 1862, Dick Thorley came to visit her. As he walked into the yard, he saw that she was canoodling with the soldier. Dick went away, rather dejected, went home, opened a bottle of gin and started drinking it. And while he was doing that, he was sharpening his cutthroat razor. He bound the handle of the razor so that it wouldn't fold on him and he came back here to court number four. There were three young boys playing hopscotch in the yard and they watched Dick go up to the door and hammer on the door with intent. Eliza opened the door and he lunged at her straight away and he cut into the side of her face and a very deep cut into the side of her throat. She collapsed onto the floor, blood oozing from the large gash in the side of her throat. He threw down the razor and he ran off. In fact, he ran all the way to the spa pub in Abbey Street where he bought himself two bottles of ginger beer and drank them. He shook hands with the landlord afterwards, I presume knowing that he'd never see the landlord again, and set off home. Eliza was still alive when the three boys ran up to her and they fetched a doctor German from Friargate. He came back, they carried her into the house and laid her on the sofa. She died in the doctor's arms while he was trying to stem the flow of blood. Eliza was duly coffined and buried. Dick Thorley was arrested and taken to the lockup in Lockup Yard. He was tried and sentenced for murder and he was hanged in front of Vernon Street Jail in front of 20,000 people. 20,000 people that turned up to watch Derbyshire's last public execution. Liza! Liza! 
What do you want? You, you know all of you. You do. You know what I mean. I don't want, want nothing back. else to do with you. Have, you. have you got that soldier? I don't want else. nothing else to do with you. On. you I don't want soldier? no more to do with you. But I love you. Go away. Love I don't you. want no more to do with you. Take that then. Take that. James Potter lived at number 59 Traffic Street with his wife. They lived here in marital turmoil. He was a very unstable man and had been a sheriff's bailiff. He was fired because he could never get the right house. They fell on hard times and took in a lodger to help them pay their way. Potter soon conjured up in his mind that his wife was having an affair with the lodger. Every time he came home drunk, he used to beat up his wife. One night, he got particularly violent and his wife ran out of the house and hid in an alleyway here in Traffic Street. Unfortunately, his wife persuaded her to go home. It was the wrong decision. During the night, they had a violent argument and James Potter stabbed his wife through the body with a sword stick. He was arrested, taken to the lockup in Derby and tried for murder. They tried to make out that he was mad and to get him off, but the death sentence was passed. He was taken back to Vernon Street Jail and put on death row. Later on, a doctor visited him and they decided that he was in fact insane. And the Home Secretary had no option then but to commute the hanging. Potter was sent to Broadmoor Lunatic Asylum where he died a few years later. And here we are standing at the entrance to Lockup Yard. Derby police lockup was up here on the right hand side and a rather famous murder of a policeman took place up here in 1879. Let's go and have a look. And I'm now in lockup yard. Here the site of the original lockup now occupied by the fish market. From 1836 we had our own police force in Derby of approximately 12 constables and an inspector. Still preserved under these fish shops here is a, is a tunnel that stretches all the way under Lockup Yard, underneath the Market Hall and comes out where the Guild Hall clock is. The prisoners were chained and shackled and went along this tunnel to be tried and then imprisoned. And we're now actually standing in one of the barrel bolted rooms underneath the Guild Hall and for the first time ever, I've never been in here before, we've actually found what we believe to be the entrance to the tunnel that leads from Lockup Yard. The prisoners trudged all the way along the tunnel in chains and shackles, up the stairs at the back here, and up into the magistrate, of course, to be tried, and then back through this tunnel here. And we've just had a look in here, we can actually see the gable top of the tunnel and the, the bricked up area here. And of course, that's hollow. Whereas, that's totally different and of course, and there. So the tunnel is there. We've actually found the tunnel um, from Lock Up Yard to Guildhall. So that is quite a plus this morning. That's something special. Um, anybody got a chisel? These are the original stone staircase that all the prisoners trudged up on the way to trial. They've reversed them at some time, and if you can see here, they've actually turned the stairs over, and you can see the indentations the footsteps of all those people that have trudged up these stairs over the years and they've turned them because they're so worn out here and then upstairs to the magistrates courts to be sentenced and brought back down here along the tunnel still in chains and then away for transportation imprisonment or execution in 1879 a young derby policeman was murdered on this spot in the charge room of derby lockup he was murdered by a young gentleman called Gerald Mannering from Whitmore Hall in Staffordshire. Mannering was a 23-year-old ne'er-do-well who had been sent off to America to become a farmer. His father died and young Gerald came back to claim his inheritance. He then came to Derby and booked in at the Royal Hotel in the Corn Market. After a couple of nights of drinking alone, he became wanting of female companionship and visited a local brothel at number 20 Bradshaw Street in Derby. This is more or less the site of number 20 Bradshaw Street where Sophie Gilbert's brothel was. Gerald Mannering had visited Annie Green on two or three occasions. 
here at the brothel, but he now decided he wanted her to stay with him at his hotel for the rest of his visit. The madam, Sophie Gilbert, declined the offer. Mannering had bought himself a revolver and 500 rounds of ammunition, and he'd got the revolver with him and a box of ammunition. He loaded it in front of the madam and pointed it at her and said, now can I borrow Annie? Sophie said, yes, take the girl and go. And he kidnapped her at gunpoint and took Annie Green back to his hotel bedroom at the Royal Hotel in the Corn Market in Derby. This is the Royal Banqueting Suite. In 1879, this was the Royal Hotel. And this is where Mannering brought Annie Green. He took her into the hotel, wined her and dined her. They spent the night together here. And the following morning, consumed a considerable amount of claret and brandy with their breakfast. The two of them were, as the police said later, mad drunk. They got into his pony and trap outside the Royal. They were obviously going to do a few more pubs. They shot off through the streets of Derby. They were all over the road. She was waving at everybody and he was lashing the horses with his whip. In those days, furious driving, of course, was illegal. And a policeman spotted them in the corn market and gave chase. They dragged him down from his pony and trap in the yard of the Traveller's Rest on Ashbourne Road, brought him, the girl and the pony and trap back here to the lockup. Took the two of them into the lockup, into the charge room. Nobody searched him. Police didn't frisk gentlemen in 1879. They left him standing up against the wall while they were taking down Miss Green's particulars. She became a little obstropolous and she smacked one of the policemen in the mouth. A fight broke out in the charge room. Five policemen trying to drag this screaming, spitting, hissing prostitute down to the cells. Mannering, propping up against the wall, remember, was rather fond of the girl. He didn't want his girl to be manhandled by these burly policemen, but was incapable physically of doing anything on him. Then remembering, of course, what he'd still got in his pocket, a loaded five-shot revolver. Out came the revolver, in stepped Mannering. There was silence in the charge room as Mannering pointed the gun at them and uttered the immortal words, we'll have no more of this. He pulled the trigger. It hit one of the policemen in the arm, another policeman in the head, and the youngest policeman, PC Joseph Moss, took a bullet in the stomach. He died the following afternoon in the Derby General Infirmary and was buried with full military honours in Nottingham Road Cemetery. Nottingham Road Cemetery, and here behind me, the grave of PC Moss in a rather dilapidated condition, but you can just about still read here at the top, Joseph Moss, and some of the letters which have fallen off, but it does say, who was shot whilst in the execution of his duty, July 1879, aged 26 years. This is the grave of the only policeman ever to be murdered in Derbyshire. And round here, you can just decipher, if you push down the grass and the mud here, JM, 1879. The story didn't end there. Mannering was not hanged. Half the jury thought it should have been manslaughter, half the jury were for murder. They couldn't make up their minds, and so they decided to draw lots in the jury room of the Crown Courts at Derby. The man that drew the short straw said murder. The death sentence was passed, Mannering went back to Derby jail to wait execution. One of the jurors was interviewed by the local newspaper, the Derby Daily Telegraph. He spilled the beans and told them that they'd drawn lots to decide this man's fate. There were letters in the Times, letters in the Telegraph, questions in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The Home Secretary travelled to Derby and eventually had no option other than to commute the hanging. And Gerald Mannering only spent 15 years in Chatham Jail, was released, returned to his home at Whitmore Hall. His brother, who'd inherited, passed him a £5 note and an overcoat. And Gerald Mannering has disappeared from view. And this is part of the original grand jury room, where during the trial, the jury actually drew lots to decide the fate of Gerald Mannering. Six for murder, six for manslaughter. They couldn't make up their minds. 
and so they had to draw straws and the one that drew the short straw said murder and the death sentence was passed on Gerald Mannering this is the very room where they decided his fate I'm now in Normanton, Pear Tree Road and next to the Normanton Hotel is this shop quite famous this was the second-hand clothes shop of the pear tree poisoner, Alice Wielden. She was set up by MI5 during the First World War. She was a suffragette and she was running a cell for conscientious objectors from this shop. The government decided that they would put her away and MI5 sent an agent provocateur here to her shop to persuade her to take some poison in. She thought the poison was for poisoning guard dogs at a prisoner of war camp. But in fact, MI5 said that she was planning on murdering the Prime Minister of Great Britain, David Lloyd George. The poison was delivered to this shop from her son-in-law, who was a chemist in Southampton. The police arrived and took Alice away to the lockup in lockup yard in Derby. She was tried at the Old Bailey for high treason and was imprisoned for the whole of the First World War. She then returned home to London Road and lived the life of a recluse until her death in 1919. And here in Nottingham Road Cemetery lie the remains of the alleged pear tree poisoner, Alice Wielden. She was released from prison and died a recluse in 1919 and is buried here in her auntie's grave. If you lifted this gravestone, you would not find the name of Alice Wielden on it. At the funeral, a red flag was draped over her coffin by her son, Willie Wielden, the conscientious objector and communist. And of course, no film on crime and punishment could be complete without a visit to Derby's Shire Hall. Built in 1659 and the scene of all the famous murder trials in Derbyshire for nearly 300 years. It's now due for refurbishment and so this is probably the last time that anyone will see inside it as it is now. So let's go in and have a look. This is the original 1659 bit and this is where the trial of the Pentridge revolutionaries took place in 1817. It turned out to be England's last revolution and the three ringleaders William Turner, Isaac Ludlam and Jeremiah Brandreth were sentenced in this very courtroom that we're standing in now to be hanged, drawn and quartered for high treason. They were taken back from here to the county jail in Firegate before the execution the Prince Regent commuted the drawing and quartering. They were taken out and hanged in front of 6,000 people, including the poet Shelley. They were then taken down and beheaded one at a time. Their bodies thrown into their coffins with their heads and they were taken down and buried in St. Robert's Churchyard. That trial was special and that's why it was held in this big room here. But most of the murder trials took place in court number one, which is just over here. So we'll go and have a last look at that courtroom. Court number one, solicitors only through that door. So I won't go through that one. Here I am, in what's left of court number one, where most of the murder trials took place. The judge's chair here. The jury would be in, the solicitors, the clerks, the accused, as the judge came through this door, and everyone shouted, all stand! The judge came and took his seat here. Dick Thorley was brought here, 
and tried in 1862, the last man hanged in public in Derby. And behind here is the dock where all the accused were sentenced. Thorley stood there and many, many other murderers. But the youngest person to stand in this dock was a young boy called William Wilde from Church Broughton in Derbyshire. He was only 14. He was sentenced here to hang for the murder of two young children from Church Broughton. The judge placed a black cap on his head and the words of the judge reverberated around this courtroom. That you be taken back from this place to the place from whence you came and from there to a place of lawful execution where you are to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may the Lord have mercy upon your soul. Take him down. William Wilde burst into tears and he was escorted by two burly policemen through this little door and down into the cells and then back to Vernon Street Prison to await execution. His execution was respited and was eventually commuted to life transportation. And William Wilde disappeared from this country to Botany Bay in Australia. And it still says on this door, to the court in handcuffs. These are the quite modernised cells that are still preserved underneath the courtroom here. A young girl was pressed to death beneath these county courts in 1665. She'd been sentenced for stealing a pair of gloves, but she would not plead guilty or not guilty. So she was taken back to the deepest dungeon beneath this building, a room where no light could enter, and weights of iron as heavy as she could bear and heavier placed upon her body. On the first day she was fed three coarse morsels of bread, and the second day three draughts of water from the stagnant pool near the prison door. And she was left as she eventually died. And people say that this was the last sentence of pressing to death to be carried out in this country. Here, somewhere in these dungeons, underneath the Shire Hall. But while we're in here, let's just have a little look round here and see what there is still preserved, still to be seen in here. Not very old bars. You must remember that this place, of course, has been modernised because it wasn't long ago that this was still used as courts. And through here, parts of the original dungeons. I haven't got a light with me or a candle. And all I can do is venture a little way in, probably for the last time, before these tunnels, of course, are demolished to make way for new magistrates' courts, which are going to be built on this very site. And this staircase takes us up to court number two, where again the accused would come up these stairs, just as I'm doing now, to stand in this dock. This one, quite good condition still, and apparently is going to remain more or less as it is now. And now, a last trip down this corridor to the 1828 part, which is due for demolition. The bars are still here, but have been burnt away, ready for removal, which takes us through to the old, original cells. Down here through this corridor. These were only holding cells. 
Prisoners were only stored here, for want of a better word, while they were awaiting trial. And the old gates, of course, still preserved. And the cells to be seen probably for the last time before they go. I hope that when this is demolished that I can have at least one of these doors which are pretty old and still now I've slammed this and I don't know that I can get out I hope I can I can't Mr cameraman would you kick the door for me please I'm stuck in this cell luckily there's a bell it doesn't ring. I can see a rather large smirk on the cameraman's face. I really can't get out. <laughs> Let me out, you <laughs> Help! <laughs> I was stuck. I'm not kidding. That was absolutely good. I have never been locked in a prison cell before, and I certainly don't want to be again. That really did happen. I was actually stuck in there. And so that's about the end of the Shire Hall as we know it. Um, we'll leave now. Leave it to its memories and to its ghosts and uh, return when it becomes the new magistrate's courts. A building that has told so many stories, so much terror and anguish that must have gone on within these walls. And have you ever seen such a wide street as this? This is Vernon Street, built in 1828 to accommodate the vast concourse of persons that turned up to witness public executions which took place in front of the new county jail. Built after the 1756 jail was bursting at the seams, this was the most modern prison in England and one of the first built like a state penitentiary in America with towers at each corner of the building to control the inmates. The first public execution took place here in front of this building in 1833. A feeble youth from Yeldersley near Ashbourne, George Leadham, hanged for the still hanging offence in those days of bestiality. The second execution ten years later, 1843, a big one, the Hege men. There's still a saying in Hege today, they hang them in bunches at Hege. So many people were interested in the case, they ran special trains from all of North Derbyshire and they built a specially constructed scaffold from the top left-hand side of the gatehouse. 50,000 people turned up to watch the Hege men hang. They hired out the bedroom windows and the attic rooms of Vernon Street, South Street and Friargate. The opticians did a roaring trade selling opera glasses and telescopes so people could see at the back. All the executions though, apart from the men at the top, took place on this very spot here. Although these look just like bars, they are hinged and it's a door. The gallows was built up to the lip of the window and out 17 feet to more or less where I'm standing now. And all of the accused or condemned, all men, walked out of that doorway onto the scaffold to be hanged. The last one to go was Dick Thorley on April the 11th, 1862. He was hanged by William Calcraft, the longest serving hangman in England, who served 45 years as hangman. Thorley stepped onto the scaffold, the rope was put about his neck, the white cap pulled down over his face, the lever was pulled and Thorley was launched into eternity. He hanged for the customary hour, they carried him back through there, made a plaster cast of his face and carried him down to the graveyard, which is just at the back of the wall here.
let's go and have a look at that graveyard. I'm now inside the jail, behind the wall. The graveyard is literally up against this wall. And all the hanged people and any suicides are buried, or were buried, at right angles to this wall. And all along the wall would be slate gravestones with their names and when they were hanged on it. Also, after no more public executions, the gallows would be up against this wall. They were hanged inside. All that came were the press, specially selected guests of the High Sheriff, the chaplain, the surgeon and the jailer. As you came out of the condemned cell, you saw the gallows. Not only did you see the gallows, but you also saw your grave dug ready for you. And this is number eight, Martello Tower, specially constructed for the guards, the warders, to control the inmates from inside the jail. It's got its original door still on it with its huge studs. There's a spiral staircase which takes you right to the top of the building. And at the very top there, there's a little room for the guards. It's still got a fireplace in it to keep them warm while they were on duty. The last stage of execution here at Derby Jail was a purpose-built execution shed, more or less on the site where the wellbeing clinic is now. About four years ago, I led a dig here and we uncovered the 12 foot deep execution pit, complete with its staircase and an archway where the surgeon and the jailer went down into the pit, pronounced the person dead, carried them back up and buried them in the graveyard at the side of the wall. The last three people hanged here at Derby Jail were all ex-servicemen from Chesterfield. The last one being William Henry Slack, who was executed here on this spot in 1907. These are the actual handcuffs that were used by a PC Stevens when he arrested William Henry Slack in 1907. Because executions took place inside the jail, of course, people could no longer see the execution taking place. Large crowds still gathered outside the gates, and to signify the execution had taken place, a black flag was run up the flagpole, and the death bell was rung. And this signified that the execution had taken place. After 1907, no more executions took place here, and they were either taken to Leicester, to Lincoln, or to Nottingham. And Derby's role as a place of punishment ceased. <laughs>